Hello everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, How Discovery Migrated 80% of their IT to AWS with CloudReach. When you join today's webinar, you select a join either by phone call or the computer audio. So if for any reason you'd like to change your selection, you can do so by accessing your audio pane in your control panel. You can also submit your questions through the control panel of the Q&A section. We'll collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. If for any reason we cannot get to your question, we plan on responding to each one of you through email. The deck will be available through SlideShare along with the recording of the webinar two to three days after the conclusion of this presentation. So keep an eye out for that email. My name is Sai Reddy. I'm a solutions architect with Amazon Web Services and I'll be your speaker and moderator for today's webinar. We also have Tom Ray, head of CloudReach for you US and Jared Carpenter, Project and Engagement Manager from CloudReach, presenting with me today. Rich from Discovery Communications was supposed to join us, but something urgent came up and he sends his regrets. However, he has asked Tom and Jared from CloudReach to cover his section on his behalf. To begin with, I would like to give a high-level agenda of what we're going to cover in the next one hour. In the first 10 minutes, I'll give you a quick overview of AWS. I will, I will cover why are customers choosing AWS, what are they achieving with AWS, what are some of the challenges they're facing when it comes to migrating to AWS, and how are we helping customers overcome those challenges. After that, I'll hand over to CloudReach team to talk about CloudReach services and dive deep into the Discovery Communications Migrations project. We will use the last 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A. With that, Let's get started. So, why are customers choosing AWS? Customers have selected AWS for years because we have proven ourselves committed to customer success. Our experience, service breadth and depth, pace of innovation, global footprint, pricing philosophy, and partner ecosystem are some of the reasons why customers are choosing AWS. Let me elaborate on each of these a little bit. We have spent over a decade building the world's most reliable, secure, scalable, and cost-effective infrastructure. There is no substitute for the experience of time, and no cloud provider has been in operation longer than AWS. We have been continuously expanding our services to support virtually any cloud workload, and now we have more than 90 services. We launched more than 1,000 new features and services in 2016. To support our global customer base, we operate around 16 regions and 42 availability zones across the globe. When it comes to cloud ecosystem, AWS has the largest ecosystem by far, and it continues to grow at a rapid pace. It's very likely that the SI slash consulting partner and ISV partners of your choice are already partnering with AWS. Sorry, I seems to have a problem with the moving it forward, but so what are customers achieving with AWS? I would like to highlight a couple of customer examples. Uh, we're going to talk uh, deep dive into Discovery Communications migration project, but let me highlight a couple of customer examples. Everybody knows Netflix. Netflix runs everything out of AWS. They have around 90 plus million users in more than 190 countries. Using our global regions and availability zones, they're able to quickly scale and service their user base without having to purchase expensive hardware or having to manage expensive data centers. Capital One, one of the nation's largest banks, is using AWS as a central part of their technology strategy. Capital One selected AWS for its security model as they believe that they can be more secure on AWS than in any private data center. GE Island Gas, is migrating 500 applications to the cloud as part of a major transformation, helping it attain a 52% reduction in total cost of ownership. 
these cost savings are, are in addition to other benefits such as greater speed to market and more agility. Expedia is a leading online travel company. Expedia's engineering team realized that they had to run one of their key applications in locations physically close to the customers to enable a quick response to service with minimal network latency. Expedia launched this application initially in the Asia-Pac region and then quickly replicated the service in the US and EU. So according to Expedia, latency was their biggest issue. Using AWS multi-regions, they were able to decrease average network latency from 700 milliseconds to less than 50 milliseconds. So customers adopting AWS are able to scale quickly, like Netflix, be more secure, like Capital One, save costs, like GE, and improve performance, like Expedia. A lot of enterprise companies understand the benefits of cloud. They want to focus more on their business and innovate like a startup. However, they have some real questions and concerns that they want to help with when it comes to migrating to cloud. Questions such as, what do we do with our existing investments? How do we get on board some of our skeptical stakeholders? Will there be downtime during migration? How do we manage application dependencies during migration? What about the skills and expertise needed to migrate applications to the cloud? For the last couple of years, we have been working really hard to help our customers overcome these barriers. I would like to talk about three specific areas where we think we are helping our customers overcome some of the challenges associated with migrations. First, we have developed a large and growing ecosystem of partners both consulting and ISV partners, such as CloudReach, that have the experience and skills needed to execute migrations. They can help you determine your migration strategy, create a clear roadmap for migrations, bring the skills that you need to successfully complete the migration, and even train your resources if needed and manage it after the migration if needed. The second area where we uh, try to help our customers is by creating a robust migration methodology. We have de developed this migration process based on our experience with numerous successful AWS migrations. We trained our partners on our migration framework and methodology. Our partners such as CloudReach use the same process when they do migrations. This migration process should look very familiar to anyone who migrated technology from one platform to another before. CloudReach will dive deep into this process in a little while. The third area where we work really hard to help our customers overcome some of these challenges with migrations is by developing a robust set of services and tools around migrations. Some of these services are our AWS Application Discovery Service, AWS Server Migration Service, AWS Database Migration Service, AWS Snowball, Snowmobile. AWS Server Migration Service is an agentless service that allows our customers to automate, schedule, and track server migrations, making it easy to do large-scale data center migrations. One of my favorite services, AWS Database Migration Service, helps our customers migrate databases and data warehouses to AWS easily and securely. You can do both homogeneous migrations, such as Oracle to Oracle, or heterogeneous migrations, such as Oracle to uh, Postgres, using AWS Database Migration Service and the associated AWS Schema Conversion Tool. AWS Snowball is, is another great service uh, to transfer petabyte, petabyte, petabyte scale data to AWS uh, in, a secure, in a secure way. AWS Snowmobile is an exabyte scale data transfer service used to move extremely large amounts of data securely to AWS. You can transfer up to 100 petabytes per Snowmobile. So just to quickly summarize, I talked about why are customers choosing AWS, what are they achieving with AWS, what are, the, some, of, what are some of the challenges customers might face with migrations, and how are we helping customers overcome those challenges. With that, I would like to hand over to 
Tom Bray from CloudReach, one of our premier consulting partners who has specific experience and competency and around AWS migrations. Tom, thanks for being here. Thank you very much, Dave. <coughs> and uh, it's a pleasure to be here and, and to talk to you all today and share some of our experiences along with Jared. Um, so, so if you could click forward for me one more slide there, that would be fantastic. So um, whilst he's doing that, um, I just thought we'd start today by giving a little bit of background to Discovery Communications. So we, we first met them uh, in London, actually, um, about almost a year ago. Um, and uh, we met Richard Reed, who's the, the, the VP uh, responsible for the, their corporate infrastructure. And the discussion was a, it, it's a very interesting. He gave a real insight to the business and how they operate. And uh, you know, I was surprised. It's, when you meet new customers for the first time, you really you know, start to peel back as the external brand, if you will, which is extraordinarily well, well known in terms of Discovery Communications, Discovery Channel, but you realize there's a lot more behind um, uh, these organizations. And Discovery's uh, a case, they have over 200 channels, uh, with a wide variety of content. Um, and interestingly, they, they have a, a data sheet on their website which uh, has you, gives you sort of the, the latest uh, metrics for, 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 the, for the business. And last month, they did four billion um, streams uh, of content um, from their from their from their data platforms, and you start, you start to realise the scale at which the organisation is operating at, um, and the speed at which they're having to innovate. It's um, it makes for a very interesting customer, and one that we're very privileged to be working with now for some time. So, Discovery then they are based out of uh, Washington DC, uh, is where. Uh, their HQs. They also have um, significant uh, operations in a wide, wide variety of other locations around the world, um, and including uh, um, in, from, a, from the migration perspective, which we'll come on to in a moment, Jerry walk us through, uh, including Eurosport is probably one of the larger um, assets that they have in terms of amount of infrastructure based out of Paris. So with that in mind, if we click forward one more, please. Just waiting for the slide to update. Um, the, they had essentially a number of different challenges uh, which they were looking to, to, to tackle and looking to, to AWS as being their preferred um, cloud platform. If you break it into two discrete um, areas, so on the one hand, they were looking to AWS to be a platform in which they could innovate. And uh, Discovery are looking at um, a number of different initiatives to help them um, scale their technology business, scale the infrastructure which had at their disposal. They've recently won the, uh, a contract to, um, to broadcast content for the Olympic Games, both the Winter and Summer Olympics, uh, for the forthcoming uh, um, uh, years. And as such, the, 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 the compute they need, the facilities they need, uh, being in the data center game was never going to be an option. They were actively looking at um, for, for a cloud provider which could give them that agility, that ability to, um, to expand, to, to um, consume compute uh, and technology, which was comparable with the, the flexible nature of their business. In parallel to that, they have acquired a lot of brands, a lot of organizations over the years. And as such, when we came in to do the, the assessment and discovery work with Discovery, there was a wide, wide variety of data centers, different shapes and sizes. Some were privately owned by Discovery themselves. Some were in colo facilities in all different shapes and sizes uh, uh, all over the world. And as such, they were very keen to consolidate this to help simplify the management of their infrastructure, to reduce costs, and provide um, a platform for the future. So if you just re recap on that point. So we have on one hand the innovative aspect with the, the agility they require around the broadcast of their brands and on the other side the kind of corporate mode one IT if you will, corporate infrastructure looking to consolidate that um, with the view that they were going to migrate up to 80% of those workloads out into the cloud. So if we click forward one more. So why ABS? Why was that a, a, a good fit then? This was their aspiration. Wait for the slide to update. There we go. Yeah, so there, there was there was a, there was a number of um, uh, a number of reasons for for this, but and, and, and sorry, you you picked up on this earlier in the presentation. It's it was it was Amazon's 
breadth and depth of services which helped to address both of those key requirements um, that I've just described, which really put it in AWS in a quite unique position to be able to, to achieve both, both the corporate, the mode one workloads, the, if like the engine room of the business, the mechanics of the business, and also that agility um, to create and deliver the content for their, for their channels. So Amazon very strongly aligned there uh, in, in terms of choice. If we click forward one, so as part of this, Amazon, um, in those early discussions, Amazon are very uh, pro-partner, and as such, we're encouraging Discovery to go out into the marketplace to look for partners, a variety of partners, to help them uh, achieve this end game. And as such, um, we were kindly invited in by Richard and the rest of the team um, to bid to help with them, um, specifically on the, the corp moving the corporate workloads out into AWS. And in part of that process, I think there's probably four pillars, if you will, tenants to, to, as to why we were chosen. I think there's an element of cultural fit, which ties in, in essence, to the global footprint piece as well. So CloudReach is an organization we were founded in 2009, what's called a, a native cloud integrator. This is what we do. We, we don't do on-prem, if you will. We, we purely work with public cloud um, providers. Our footprint, we have operations um, in the UK, in Benelux, specifically out of Amsterdam. We have operations in Germany, out of Munich. Uh, we have operations in Zurich, uh, Paris, uh, and then in North America, we are based out of New York, uh, where I'm based. Uh, we have Chicago and Atlanta, where Jared's based. Over and above all of that, we also have our managed service business, which is based out of Edinburgh and Vancouver, uh, providing 24-7 care for those customers that need it. So the cultural fit piece um, was super important, and just to come back to that, and it was the fact that we had teams that we could deploy in Paris going into Eurosport, as well as teams going into Washington, D.C., and occasionally into other locations, you know, places like Miami, into the Nordics, for example, was super important. Because one of the things that Jared's going to talk about today is that connection, the cultural fit, is super important to a successful project. When you're doing these data center migrations, the rapport between the teams is absolutely pivotal to success, as it is in any project, but specifically when you're doing data center migrations to the cloud, the, the, the having the clarity of direction, having that key stakeholder uh, backing, plus also having a rapport to um, provide skills transfer to the customer teams, in this case discovery, to help enable the customer to be able to do more themselves, so that either A, they can help them in terms of the velocity of the project and moving their applications, because ultimately the customer understands far better the intricacies of the specific applications than a third party would, but also B, a lot of our customers are looking to manage the infrastructure themselves thereafter. So those two points are very closely um, connected. Now the point around velocity and agility, we've been doing this for many years. So Discovery is one of a whole range of clients that we have where we've been doing data center migrations, both of corporate, what Gartner would call mode one applications, and also for building net new, if you like, more cloudy architectures um, as well. So the agility piece is born out of our methodologies, and Jared can take you through that in a minute. So we'll click forward, please, Jared. So let me introduce Jared to you. So Jared works out of our Atlanta site uh, and has been running and working on Discovery now for almost a year. So Jared, I'll hand over to you, sir, and uh, let you walk us through uh, the, uh, the intricacies of the project itself. Thank you very much, Tom, and thank you, Sai, and a good day to everybody. Uh, so before we dive into the content of this slide, I want to frame the overall engagement a bit, and then uh, it'll kind of steer our conversation as we go forward. Ultimately, the engagement breaks into three major phases. There's the migration assessment, which you can see on the slide here currently. Then there is a shared services phase, which I'll speak to momentarily. And then there's the real work effort, the actual data center migration itself. So let's start with the cloud migration assessment activities that we partner with Discovery Communications to conduct. We had an eight week window, and during that eight weeks, uh, after an initial project kickoff, where we assembled the CloudReach team, as well as the Discovery Communications team, and basically frame the project. 
we broke the uh, assessment uh, into three work streams to be completed during that eight-week period. Uh, and they are basically defined by the deliverables that each work stream yields. So a high-level design, a security and governance report, and then a migration report and plan. Start with the high-level design. In this work stream, the primary goal is to do high-level analysis of the current on-premise state, connectivity, high availability requirements, disaster recovery and backup, security and compliance, things of that nature, and then translate that to the corresponding infrastructure on AWS. At the end of that work stream, as mentioned, you get a high-level design document that will then serve as the technical cornerstone and reference point for all activities going forward through the migration. At any point, as you get into lower level activities, you should be able to come back to your high level design, reference what's been laid out there and how it's been defined to instruct the team members on the, some of the more technical and specific activities. But it's certainly a living document. And as you go forward through this process, be even beyond the assessment, uh, there are new things that are uncovered, new things that are learned. And the effort is always to come back to the high level design and assess the impact. Next deliverable will be the security and governance report. Where the high level design is the technical cornerstone, the security and governance report serves as sort of the people and process cornerstone of the project and going forward with this, this newly migrated estate, um, a guideline that can be followed in here to keep everything uh, optimized and, and adhering to the policies and procedures that have been defined. So you get into the governance and security. The, the security piece is obviously fairly straightforward. Um, ensuring that the uh, security standards that are requirement for a given customer environment are adhered to. And then governance, the, the way in which cloud resources will be consumed, tagging strategy, uh, and things of, that, uh, things of that nature. So at Discovery, during this work stream, what we learned is they had done a, a good amount of work uh, on their own before uh, engaging CloudReach, partnering with AWS uh, ProServe. And so they had a, a good foundation laid uh, in this area, security and governance. So our primary task was to partner with them to review that uh, and ensure that uh, you know, it was in a state that we felt was uh, in alignment with best practice uh, and also add to it where we could our own experiences uh, and our own insight into uh, the ways in which they could ensure that, uh, that this document was in an excellent state to, to steer go forward activities. And then of course the third work stream, uh, the migration report and the plan. So really two deliverables out of this one work stream. There's the cloud migration assessment report, which serves as essentially the initial scope. It's the identification of the hosts and their corresponding workloads uh, that will be a part of the migration. It's also where we go through the exercise of making our preliminary de determination of the migration path for each workload. I'm referring to the AWS 6R model. Um, as with the high-level design document, this is certainly a, a living guideline, so it's our initial pass at it, but certainly as you get down the road, and I'll speak to this momentarily, um, you will find that there are, there are changes, and that's, that's to be expected. We also have the migration factory design, and, and again, we'll speak a little bit about the migration factory shortly. Um, it's the approach by which CloudReach uh, migrates data centers to AWS. Uh, but in that design includes uh, the identification of tooling, uh, schedule targets, and what is the picture of the resources, both from a CloudReach perspective as well as from uh, the partner site, and what it's going to take to achieve this. I'm going to jump forward one slide. Okay, so specific to Discovery Communications and their assessment. Started off with roughly over 800 workloads across 2,000 or so servers, both uh, virtual and physical. And through that eight-week uh, process and, and through the work streams as defined, we were able to narrow that scope down to roughly 290 workloads, corporate workloads across 600 or so servers. Um, there were some guidelines that we established with Discovery Communications about where they wanted to draw the boundary between what would be a target for this particular migration phase uh, and versus uh, other migrations that, that are for the future or are running concurrently. And so the, really the demarcation was things that were directly responsible for content play out, um, you know, actual streaming of shows and events and such. 
We, of course, eliminated things that were targeted for near-term retirement, when I say near-term, uh, within the year. And then they had a large uh, on-prem exadata uh, implementation that they were leveraging still. And just due to the, the timeline that we were aiming to adhere to and some of the complexity that would be involved and resource availability, all the things that, that constrain any really IT project, um, it was determined that when we found workloads that were heavily, heavily dependent upon that uh, infrastructure on-prem, that we would de-scope those. So we were able to, at the end of that, create a cloud migration assessment report that determined the migration path of these workloads as defined, as well as the resourcing it was going to take uh, and the timing that we uh, needed to apply. And that's where the, the global work stream design comes out of that. Looking at the timeline that we had for discovery and their global presence, um, that was an excellent fit for CloudReach as we also have that same global presence and uh, extremely fortuitously, uh, as Tom alluded to early, uh, one of the largest data centers that they had in scope to migrate is located in Paris, where we also have a, an office, an actual physical presence, and a team of CloudReachers um, that are to be embedded in that, uh, in that office to work directly with the Discovery Communications resources there to maintain velocity and facilitate communications and ensure that that relationship that, that Tom alluded to uh, is nurtured and grown uh, because that's really the way by which we can be successful through a project of this nature. So during the assessment, some of the joint challenges that the combined CloudReach and Discovery Communications team faced. The workloads that were in scope were spread across many siloed business units, all under the Discovery Communications umbrella. Uh, I feel like this is a fairly common challenge in many large enterprises, at least it has been in my experience. So the solution, excellent communication, tight collaboration, and the designation of key points of contact from each business unit, as well as some of the support organizations like networking, infrastructure, InfoSec, et cetera. Uh, in essence, putting together a, a SWAT team or a cloud center of excellence designed to help us bridge those gaps and work between those silos to make sure that we could understand and collaborate fully across all these different business units and perspectives uh, as we went through our assessment so to fully understand what was the nature of, of the estate we would be migrating. Another uh, challenge we ran into was at concurrent to our assessment, there was a, a CMDB refresh project underway. Um, and so walking into that environment, we, we didn't have a, a solid baseline as far as a pre-existing CMDB uh, from which to work, um, which is obviously challenging, especially to an assessment phase. So it was an iterative approach that we had to take. Uh, we aligned ourselves with the CMDB project initiative um, and made sure that our approach remained sufficiently flexible to ingest uh, new pictures of that data as it was made available. Um, and we also then translated that to a somewhat iterative revision approach to our overall uh, assessment outputs, our deliverables there. Uh, because certainly as we learned more about what was coming out of the CMDB and as that picture became more clear, it had a direct impact on what our scope was going to be. But leveraging a, a, an agile approach to this phase allowed us to be very flexible and to respond quickly. And then finally, there was a limited penetration of pre-existing automated estate discovery tooling. And if I were to expand on that a bit more, there's also a, there's a very uh, mature uh, and robust change management process in place at discovery uh, for any number of reasons that had to be adhered to. So we were limited in our ability to deploy uh, agent-based discovery tooling. Uh, we also had somewhat of a limited time frame um, to deploy tooling of any kind, uh, in an automated nature that is, uh, and collect meaningful data because we had uh, an assessment window that, that was um, shooting for velocity. So how did we solve that? Um, close and frequent engagement with our stakeholder groups, both technical and uh, business as well as examining what tooling was already in place for their management and monitoring of their on-premise state globally, um, and specifically uh, Splunk, and this uh, was of tremendous value to us as we went through this assessment phase. So partnering with their teams and using some of our own tools and experience to leverage what was already there to augment uh, the, the process of meeting with stakeholders, application owners, uh, and IT uh, experts and SMEs as well. So before we move on, uh, Tom, your thoughts regarding the 
importance of the assessment phase and things that, that ensure success there. Yeah, sure. Good point, Jonathan. So I think it, it, I, I spent a lot of time explaining to um, to stakeholders and our customers, you know, the importance of getting the foundations right. Foundations in terms of the the landing zone, the shared services, the the, the kind of common elements that are going to be required, but not losing sight of the fact that these projects involve a lot of people. And the, there's, there's, a, there's an excellent document um, that Amazon produced called the Cloud Adoption Framework. And elements that, 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 uh, that Jared was showing you on the previous slide, I would call out are, are super important in terms of how the team is going to be organized, what skills do they currently have or they will they need in the future. And it's about getting these elements, these ingredients in right at the beginning, so that as these workloads start to migrate, people understand why you're doing the project, they feel they have the right skills in place, um, your, your customers organize correctly in order to be successful. So there's a great URL, um, there's a great white paper from Amazon which just recently been updated in the adoption framework. I would strongly suggest that people do take a read of that. Um, and then, as you say, Jared, there are always going to be blockers. The quality of data and the practicality of deploying tools into our customers' estates, pretty much every single migration we do, we go in wanting to use our default toolkit. <laughs> Whether we can or not, we need to be quite adaptive because, because of certain security controls, perhaps down to time, and, and so on. It, you know, it, it will determine as to you know, the, the actual approach uh, once we get into the, the meats and bones of the project. So, uh, well summarised, uh, Jared. Thank you for that. Thank you, Tom. So, the next phase: uh, shared services setup. Uh, another eight weeks allocated in partnership with Discovery for this phase. So having completed the assessment, high-level design, security and governance report, cloud migration assessment report, as well as the initial migration factory plan, uh, we moved on to this next phase. So we've got the plan laid out from the assessment, and this is an opportunity to go through the uh, procurement and setup of tooling, both for migration as well as uh, monitoring and management, if those are anything is undefined there, as well as project prep. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, from a tooling perspective, we're looking to see, based on the composition and the operating systems that are in play, the existing layout of on-prem, what are the tools we're going to use to implement and execute on the migration paths for the workloads that have been identified. So in instances, for example, where it's a, a re-host, what is the tool that we're going to use to actually do that lift and shift? What are some of the guidelines if we're doing re-platforms and leveraging this as an opportunity to do operating system upgrades, things of that nature. So. Uh, all part of the shared services setup. Project prep as well, where we're going through and uh, reviewing and making adjustments to the project team composition as needed. We're also establishing some of the fundamental things that you would expect out of any IT project in terms of communication plan, escalation paths, uh, reporting cadence, uh, KPIs and metrics, uh, just understanding what the executive team at Discovery was interested in seeing uh, relative to the project and its progress, what was important to them to be able to communicate with their uh, stakeholders and with their leadership. We also go through an environment verification. As I mentioned, when CloudReach was engaged with Discovery, they had already started along their cloud journey uh, with guidance from AWS. So they had a pre-existing uh, AWS infrastructure that had been established in terms of accounts and VPCs and various network connectivity. So our exercise uh, with the CloudReach team was to go through and do verification and ensure that everything was in alignment with best practices, once again, much like security and governance. Uh, analyze the security groups and IAM roles that were in, in place and ensure that, their, that Active Directory connectivity was uh, implemented properly and, and again, in line with, uh, with best practices. It was essentially checking the boxes to ensure that the environment into which we were about to migrate workloads um, was optimal and was as we would uh, advise any of our customers to configure it. And then as a bonus, uh, there were some uh, immediate migration targets that were established due to a number of business drivers. So we had a data center in Paris that was leveraged primarily as a disaster recovery site. And then in Miami, we had a data center um, where there was a subset of workloads. Um, for varying reasons, there was a need to be out of those data centers uh, before the end of the year 2016, um, which gave us uh, only a portion of those eight weeks, roughly four weeks to be specific, uh, to get those workloads migrated. Um, what was super beneficial there was that uh, establishment and being able to leverage that 
at Cloud Center of Excellence, that SWAT team, partnership of CloudReach and the Discovery Communications team, uh, to be able to dive right in. Um, another uh, beneficial part of having to do these kind of expedited, expedited high priority migrations was it served to set a precedent, a, a, a pilot, if you will. Um, it was a quick win that we could then partner with Discovery to use internally to kind of uh, push down some political barriers and build confidence uh, not only in the, the public cloud itself, but also in our migration approach and the methodology that we'd be using. Um, so it was a really great opportunity to kind of uh, the proverbial two birds with one stone. Um, we were able to meet some, some very pressing business needs for discovery, as well as build some political capital, if you will, or some goodwill towards the project uh, very early on. Tom, any thoughts before we uh, proceed to the migration factory portion? I, the point you made at the end there, John, I think it's a very valid one, that you know, these projects, there's a lot of prep goes in, you know, you're, you're kind of at this point sort of eight weeks into the project, in fact longer in this case with the shared service build, and you're looking to have your ambassadors within the project, within these organizations, so getting some quick wins, helping people understand, you know, the, the, the process and getting that better down early doors is, um, yeah, is, is always a, a top tip, yeah, for sure, I definitely agree with that point. Okay, so we will move forward here to the major effort, the actual data center migration itself. So having done the assessment, gone through our shared services exercise to lay the foundation and understand the landscape, both on-prem and in the cloud, it was time to actually begin the migration. So a bit about the approach that CloudReach takes, this is exactly what we're using in partnership with Discovery, and that's the migration factory, uh, broken into three main pieces. There's the design phase, the build and migrate phase, and then the cutover and test phase. In the design phase for the migration factory, um, we're going into deep dives into the workflows. We reference that high level design, as mentioned, the output of one of our key work streams from the assessment phase, but now we are looking on a workload by workload basis. We're examining the outputs of questionnaires from stakeholders, both application, business, and IT. Uh, we're also looking at information provided by any automated discovery tooling that's able to be leveraged. Uh, we we per specifically leveraged Splunk uh, monitoring data very heavily here. And the, the point is to come out with a low level design on a per workload basis to really understand at a detailed and very technical level what will it take and what needs to exist to have this workload successfully moved to AWS uh, so that it functions properly there and, and it can be considered a successful migration. Um, this is the, uh, the low-level design that comes out of the design phase in our migration factory approach is what then guides the actual execution of the technical resources on the project uh, and can be then also used as uh, documentation about the workload on a go-forward basis. So dual-pronged benefit in that it's critical to our ability to execute, but then discovery then has a library of detailed, very detailed information about the workloads that have been migrated that they can use uh, going forward as a reference point. One last bit about the design phase, as I mentioned earlier, it's also a time to ensure that the migration path, which of the six R's we've decided to, uh, to leverage for the given workload, to make sure it's still appropriate based on what we now know at a low level. And there are certainly instances where we've encountered that perhaps something looked like it could be a simple uh, lift and shift re-host, uh, but upon closer examination and ingestion of additional information, um, it's a larger scale effort. Or perhaps it's an opportunity to start greenfield and make up for some technical debt, uh, not just simply by virtue of moving to the cloud, but also uh, from an operating system perspective and things of that nature. So that flows into the build and migrate portion of the migration factory. So this is the execution of the plan laid out in the low-level design phase. Um, from a rehost perspective, or that lift and shift, uh, we elected to partner with Cloudador as the migration tool uh, that we would be using at Discovery. Um, we've been using that actually very successfully along the way. Um, for those workloads where we uh, elected to go with a kind of a greenfield or a, you know a build approach, uh, which lines up with the replatform R um, combination of cloud formation and a, an open source tool that CloudReach developed called Scepter uh, uh, to build the necessary uh, infrastructure as code and then partnering with Discovery for the deployment of that infrastructure and then handing it over to application owners, which is our next phase in the migration factory: the cutover and test. So. In the instances of builds, as I mentioned, this is handing over the AWS infrastructure to the application teams and supporting their testing. 
So we hand it to them, they do their installation and configuration. We partner with them to ensure that if they run into challenges, uh, that we can ensure that the underlying AWS infrastructure um, is solid and functioning properly as, as a point of troubleshooting. And then certainly for those where we migrate, and this really represents the vast majority of the workloads that we're moving, the lift and shift, use of Cloud Endor. This is cut over coordination and planning with all the necessary stakeholders, and then supporting once again the end, end user testing, which in this case, a slight deviation from kind of a traditional Q&A uh, period or a, a pre-prod testing, it ends up actually being more of a, of a verification test. So we do the cutover, and we're in production, we partner with the necessary stakeholders, and then they ensure that everything is working as it was before we did the cutover. Uh, the goal, especially in the, in the migrate with the, the rehost path, is as much end user transparency as we can achieve. Um, and we've been very successful with Discovery uh, in doing that so far. So a, a graphical representation of the migration factory, uh, we refer to it as the conveyor, uh, in keeping with the, uh, the migration factory analogy. So again, LLD and prep phase, uh, and then as you start that part of the conveyor up, you introduce, uh, you get to the point where you can now do uh, execute your build and migrate phase, and your cutover and test phase. And as you can see from this graphic, the goal is to have X number of apps on the conveyor at any one time. Um, so when you really spin up the migration factory, you've worked out some of the kinks and, and nuances of the process uh, relative to everybody's unique environment. You've got a number of apps in each different phase. And this is really how we go about establishing uh, real velocity in the migration process. A quick note about the team composition. Um, from CloudReach, we have one cloud engagement monitor, monitor, one cloud architect. We have two sysdevs in the United States and then two additional that are out of our Paris office. Um, as we mentioned before, part of our global footprint. And this also helps us to work very closely with the uh, Eurosport team members and, and that large data center target that we have in Paris. Uh, from the discovery communication side, we have a dedicated project manager, uh, two cloud team members, and then representation from a variety of internal support organizations, as mentioned here, info security, network, um, app owner groups, and platform and infrastructure teams. Uh, this really comprises kind of our cloud center of excellence. Um, I will say a quick note, the uh, participation of a dedicated project manager from discovery has been tremendously valuable to the success of our project thus far. Um, there are many times where we initially meet with a customer and there's some um, a dedicated project manager is necessary on either side of that fence. Um, what I can say is that from our experiences at Discovery, it is, is beyond valuable um, to facilitate uh, coordination, um, help to move through road, roadblocks very efficiently. Um, it is, a, is an extremely valuable asset to have. Um, and we've been very fortunate in having a tremendous working relationship with our project manager partner at Discovery. So where we are currently in our data center migration, Paris data center, as mentioned, fully migrated. Miami data center, fully migrated in a matter of weeks. Uh, and a data center, one of the primary data centers in the United States, uh, just recently finished up uh, here last week in about a 10 week span. On the conveyor currently, uh, the graphic that I referenced before, uh, we've got data centers uh, in the Nordics region. We are leveraging our CloudReach team both in the US and France to overcome some time zone challenges uh, very effectively. Uh, and then the large data center in Paris, and that will be uh, led by our CloudReach uh, team out of our Paris office uh, with support from the US, um, certainly giving us the ability to work around operating hours and to accommodate um, certain schedule constraints that may exist having wide time zone support between the two countries. Work that's currently being planned, um, a variety of other data centers that have smaller workload counts but are, are highly globally distributed, as well as a base of SharePoint-based workloads, um, all on that SharePoint platform, which we'll be endeavoring to kind of move um, in its entirety. Challenges that we've encountered so far, um, Certainly maintaining velocity with many competing responsibilities uh, within Discovery, not just the business as usual type of things, but certainly Discovery Communications being a, a large enterprise has many competing projects and large scale initiatives that are consuming the time of many of our resources. And so uh, close reporting, close communication, not just with the, the, the people on the project team, but also with our champion 
uh, and sponsor has helped us to overcome many of those. Um, and then there's also an, a concurrent effort to homogenize the infrastructure across the various business units. Um, as we mentioned at the uh, outset of this webinar, uh, Discovery has uh, acquired several companies over time and they brought to the table their own unique infrastructure picture. Uh, and there's an ongoing effort to align all of that to a single standard. And the impact to us, of course, is that now we've got uh, several large infrastructure type projects that are all going concurrently. So there are some planning considerations, resource availability constraints that have to be accommodated. But uh, again, leveraging an, an agile approach to the project and close communication, um, we're having really good success with our discovery partners in overcoming some of those challenges. Tom, any additional thoughts on the data center migration? Uh, the, the, the last thing I'd add is the, um, and you, you touched on it there a couple of times, Jared, is the word velocity. These, these projects, they can, they can take time, can take time, and the measuring velocity, both in terms of numbers of servers, amount of storage, but importantly, applications migrated against the benchmark, so in the planning piece that Jared talked about right at the beginning, monitoring, measuring, and reporting upon those metrics is super important because if these things, just because you can refactor an application and you can use some of the new features, <laughs> it may not be in the best interest of, the, of, the, of the, uh, the, the stakeholders and it's all about maintaining that velocity, completing the project on time and on budget. That's something that you know, we can, we're pretty obsessed about um, yeah, but it's super important for the, for the success of a project like this. Thank you, Tom. So, just, so before we go to the Q&A, just very, very quickly, um, we do have a series of events coming up um, in New York, Atlanta, and Chicago. These are um, going to be run in partnership with AWS, and we're doing these sessions inside the AWS um, offices. Specifically, we're going to be talking about um, cloud operating models. So, with Jared and the team, and uh, I've finished these projects, of course, there's now a lot of new infrastructure that's sitting inside AWS that needs to be looked after, managed, optimized, in some cases re-architected and so on. And we're going to be taking people through the practical steps and how to build out the operating model. So for those of you interested, drop down the, the offices nearest to you and um, do reach out to your local rep, uh, your local AWS rep or indeed CloudReach rep if you're directly talking to us already and get you arranged to uh, get you a seat at the table to come along. Uh, and learn uh, learn from Amazon and CloudReach around cloud operating models. So dates dates your calendar there. And I think we are at, at that stage. We're I see we're uh, we're 11 minutes to the hour. So I think we're handing over now to um, Sai, and we're going to be doing some uh, some Q and A. Oh, thanks, Tom and Jared. Uh, now before we start the Q and A, I want to just uh, start off uh, congratulating CloudReach. Uh, they've been recently you know rated as a leader. Uh, for cloud managed services by a well-known analyst firm. Uh, congratulations, Tom, and your team. Thank you. Uh, we got a bunch of questions here, very good questions. So let me start with, uh, we got a question from um, Arun. Um, this question is, what qualifies lift and shift versus uh, re-architecting? Very, very good question. So it really comes down to listening to the customer. Um, well, maybe I maybe I'm misinterpreting the question. I think so. There's two two but two aspects. Of this is so re-architecting is where you're you're redesigning the application to take advantage of cloud architecture uh, and best practices. So, for example, you may want to to break up an application to use the queuing services from Amazon to use serverless architectures with things like Lambda. Now, that's you're breaking apart applications, but there needs to be a good business case for doing that because it does take a lot of effort. Imagine the the testing schedule associated with that. Lift and shift, on the other hand, is leaving the application, the operating system, the storage intact and moving it using tools like Cloud Endure uh, across into AWS as is uh, with very modest amount of change. So um, th there's those two buckets, if you will. So rehost, replatform, uh, and then there's a mid sorry, a refactor. And there is a middle ground. The middle ground is called replatforms. This is the six R's that uh, Jared alluded to. So replatform is where you're making that modest change. So the application code doesn't change, um, but you may wish, for example, to use Amazon's RDS, their managed database service, 
um, if you were migrating um, MS SQL, Oracle, or open source database, um, to making modest changes to the application, you're taking advantage of some aspects uh, of, of AWS, but the code remains intact, and the testing and level of effort is very modest. So re-host, re-platform, and then refactor being the, uh, the um, taking applications back to the bare bones. And then just to finish that out, Tom, the uh, retain, certainly those things that have to keep uh, remain on-prem, retiring those applications that are determined to be no longer needed, um, mm -hmm. and then repurchase or a shift to perhaps a software as a service model. I did see a, there was a question about the 6R, so I thought I'd just take advantage there. Um, mm -hmm. a, a real quick note, if I might, just how that qualification applied at Discovery, kind of real world. Um, another, you know, the key driver for us uh, was a combination of technical complexity, but probably more so was about velocity. Um, Rehost, the lift and shift tends to be the fastest migration path um, because as Tom alluded to, you are picking up an existing infrastructure and workload, a server or servers and moving them to AWS uh, with some, some kind of some tweaks at the end of that to make them functional. So for discovery, the, one of the primary goals was get to the cloud. Um, and so as such, uh, for the vast majority of the workloads that we are working on and continue to work on, Rehost is the path due to time um, and, and the velocity that they need to achieve and what some of their uh, constraints are. Um, and then there's always the opportunity in a subsequent future phase to optimize. And that's where examination of uh, application re-architecting will take place. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Jared. Uh, there was a question about uh, what percentage, uh, there was a question from Trevor. What percentage of the infrastructure was virtualized before the migration? Uh, do you guys have any insight uh, on that, Tom and Jared? Yeah, Tom, I can field this one. Um, and I don't have the, the specifics in, in front of me right now, but the, the large majority, uh, well over 60%, I'd say even over 70% uh, of their state was virtualized um, prior to our arrival. So dealing with, with a lot of, uh, lot of VMs, um, fairly extensive use of uh, VMware products um, prior to, to us beginning our work. Okay, uh, thanks, Jared. Uh, there was another question from uh, Dimitri. Uh, do you, did uh, Discovery and CloudReach establish direct connect between customers, data centers, and AWS regions um, as part of this project? Uh, yes. So, um, as I mentioned uh, during the slide presentation, when CloudReach was engaged, Discovery Communications had already started along their cloud journey. As a part of that, they had established uh, direct connects to several of their on-prem data centers. Um, definitely one in their primary data center here in the U.S. and another um, in the UK. Um, and so for instances where, uh, for one reason or another, usually technical, we had to have a workload that we were migrating, communicate back to an on-prem um, database or something, or a file share, something of that nature. Um, we heavily leveraged those direct connects to, to ensure that the latency introduced was minimal and that application performance was maintained. Okay, thanks, Jared. There was a question from Jay um, talk, uh, asking a question about scope of the project. Um, I know I think Jared mentioned in the beginning you started with uh, close to 1,000 applications and then you narrowed it down to uh, some subset of the applications as the first phase. Uh, can you talk more about the, 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 the thinking and some of the qualification criteria that went into that? Sure. Uh, certainly every customer environment is going to be different. Uh, at Discovery, um, as I mentioned, there were some overarching tenets that were agreed to early in the project, really during our kickoff and initiation um, of the assessment. Um, those were very specific to the nature of some of the workloads. They had some that were, uh, like I guess, as I mentioned, playout based. They're actually just actually streaming content. Um, there were some concurrent projects that were handling that, that were descoped. Um, we put a, a box around the workloads that we were focusing on, we being CloudReach, um, to be those that are part of their corporate IT, right? The support applications and workloads that uh, are not directly responsible for broadcasting content, but rather support the organization on the back end and it's supporting BUs. Um, additionally, and this holds true um, in my experience in just about every customer environment, um, as you get under the hood and you're working on you know, what your state looks like, they, there's this opportunity to do this evaluation where you say, do we even want to move this workload um, given that it's, it's limited in its functionality or you have an opportunity to consolidate what it does with something else? Um, and so there was a, a big chunk of items where collectively the decision was, this is going to be retired, and it's going to be retired in a short enough time frame that
that it fits with their overall migration goal. Um, certainly if something had a retirement time frame on the order of years, two years or something like that, um, it would likely become a migration target uh, because the overarching goal was to be migrated out 80% there, thereabouts by the end of 2017. Um, but for those where within 2017 it was reasonably uh, expected to retire the workload, they would be descoped. Um, and so what we were left with were workloads that were uh, sufficiently impactful, um, had a long enough remaining life, and didn't, uh, didn't violate any of our kind of overarching principles with regards to workload type. Oh, great. <clears throat> that makes sense because if the applications are supposed to be decommissioned, um, it doesn't make any sense to spend any more resources uh, migrating that application to the cloud. Great. Uh, there's a question from Melvin. Uh, what tools, if any, were used to discover clients' existing environment applications, um, et cetera? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and it comes up, obviously, at the beginning of every assessment. There's the question about tooling. Um, early on in the assessment, as we met with Discovery, we're kicking off the project, uh, not just from a project management kind of style kickoff, but also a technical kickoff. That was the, the, one of the first questions that we partnered with them to answer. Um, their environment being unique as it is, um, some of the, the constraints that they have with their ability to uh, deploy any sort of agent-based discovery and whatnot, we were somewhat limited um, with what we could use in terms of automated tooling. Um, but we also certainly didn't want to um, have to rely exclusively on communication and questionnaire and things like that, because just from a velocity perspective. So what we were able to do was look to see what they already had in place and what sort of information that it provided to us. So um, they had a, a, a solar winds deployment that was had limited penetration across their virtualized estate. Um, collectively, we determined that it, it really wasn't going to benefit us to use. But what they did have was a, a very robust and, and uh, wide Splunk deployment, pulling lots of like, just amazing metrics um, relative to what we were able to pull out of it. There was the moment of concern. We're like, man, automated tooling could be a challenge. And then we look and partner with some of their Splunk admins, and it's like, this is a tre treasure trove of data. Um, so we actually were able to le leverage that to do, I won't say automated discovery because it's not truly what it's doing, but the data that we were able to ingest coming out of that um, yielded a very similar result. Uh, thanks, Jared. Uh, I think we have time for one more, one last question. Uh, uh, Tom, um, you know, there, there are two types of customers here, one that are already uh, started a migration and one that are thinking of starting a migration. Do you have any, mm -hmm. any tips and, uh, for those uh, two types of customers? Yeah, yeah, sure. So I think on the, for those that are considering, the, the key thing I would uh, urge people to do is to find yourself uh, uh, a good quality partner, be a cloud rich or someone else for that matter, I would, my strong suggestion would be to go for a cloud native partner, somebody who's done this many times before. I would put particular emphasis on the business case. Uh, I know that sounds obvious, but working out the return on investment for these projects is complicated. There are a lot of moving parts and being able to mold your environment in an optimized fashion, because bear in mind obviously the cloud cost models are, um, are variable, uh, it is absolutely key. So getting that business case, in many cases, either you know, data center consolidation or building net new applications, uh, there is an ROI story to be told. So don't stop, go and find a, a new specialist. For those that are already inside the project, do take a look at the adoption framework uh, from AWS. Uh, there's a lot of really good material in there. Uh, which will help you build out the building blocks to support not just the technical migration of these applications, but get your organization ready to accept them and to to really start to leverage the power of the cloud. So that would be my my, my suggestion in either case. Thanks, Tom. <clears throat> thanks, Jared. Uh, I think we're almost at the top of the hour here. Uh, thanks for sharing this and a wonderful you know discovery communications migration story uh, sh and sharing some of the tips and lessons learned with our attendees. Uh, thanks to all the attendees for taking time to attend this webinar. We're not able to get to all the questions, but we'll reach out to you and respond to you uh, to your questions through email. Uh, this concludes our webinar. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you.